You are now locked in the Conspiracy Asylum. Your straight jacket and padded cell awaits. Hello and welcome to the Conspiracy Asylum. This is DJ Schwartz once again, and we're going to be doing another solo episode. We're not going to call them bonus episodes anymore. We're going to call it a solo episode. Kim is still at work. I am home alone because Thursdays, my stepkids go with their dad for a while. So I'm here all by myself, which is fine. So I get to do a podcast. And this podcast is going to be on Johnny Gosh. And if you do not know who Johnny Gosh is, Johnny Gosh was kidnapped on September 5th, 1982, and has been, never been found or heard of since. And the story is very interesting. A bunch of twists and turns. We've got everything from pedophilia to politics to murder to crazy people. We got everything. It's a very interesting story. And Johnny Gosh was the very first kid featured on a milk carton because of his mother, Noreen Gosh. So now we're going to go through a synopsis of the events that happened on September 5th, 1982. Now, Johnny Gosh was born... John David Gosh in West Des Moines, Iowa on November 12th, 1969. So when Johnny was 12 years old, he wanted to save up for a dirt bike like many kids like myself. I wanted a dirt bike. I ended up getting a dirt bike when I was like uh, six or so and I crashed it straight into a fence right when I got it. But I ended up riding it forever until I blew the piston out the front of the engine when I was like uh, 16 or something. That was side squirrel a little bit, sorry. He wanted a dirt bike. So he got a paper route, just like a lot of kids in the 80s. You know, I grew up in the 90s and 2000s. I was born in 88, so I was not an 80s kid. It was a lot different back then. Kids were kind of roaming a little bit more free. Uh, parents were a little undereducated about. The word pedophile was not in anybody's vocabulary back then. Not like it is now. It's kind of like, think about human trafficking. Human trafficking was not in our vocabulary up until like maybe five, ten years ago. In the 90s, nobody would have known what human trafficking is, especially in the 80s when this happened. But the main events of what happened on September 5th, 1982, Johnny Gosh got up really early in the morning to start his paper route. He went and cut across the neighbor's yard to go down the street to get his papers. He had a little red wagon and he brought his dog Gretchen with him. And it was this little kind of wiener dog. It was his companion. He loved this dog. And mind you, he was doing the paper route by himself, which was very common back then. He just wants to earn some money to save up for a dirt bike, which at this point, he had already had the paper route for over a year. And he already had his dirt bike. He saved up. He got his dirt bike. This seemed like a really responsible, just a good, wholesome kid. And it's just terrible what happened to him. On this September morning, he decided to do the paper route by himself, which, like I said, it was pretty common back then. But his dad usually accompanied him on his paper route. So it was kind of strange for him to just go off and do it by himself, which is completely fine. I mean, back then, he's 12 years old. You know, when I was a kid, I was 12 years old. I walked around the neighborhood by myself. Probably not at like 5 in the morning like this guy. I walked around the neighborhood by myself and I felt completely safe. Nowadays, it's a little bit more sketchy. You know, 12, 13, that's about when you're going to start letting your kid go off by themselves. You know, I'm kind of a helicopter parent. I try not to be, but I've got four kids, so it scares me a little. But nonetheless, he went out and did the paper route by himself. There are a lot of different stories of what happened. What we all know for a fact is that Johnny's customers, the people that received the newspaper, didn't receive their newspaper that morning, so they started calling the Gosh's house. John Gosh, big John Gosh, his dad, was answering all these phone calls being like, oh, you know, he's probably just running late. I'm going to go out there and help him. John went out. Went down the street, and that's where he found little Johnny Gosh's wagon and his pet dog, Gretchen. So that immediately was a red flag. They immediately called the police, and it took the police 45 minutes to respond to this. Back then, it wasn't as big of a deal as it is now to have a missing kid. Back then, you know, especially with kids that are either preteens or teenagers... They just assumed that they might be a runaway, so they didn't want to spend a lot, a whole lot of money on trying to trace these kids down, which it's kind of sad. In this case, they should have been just out manhunting right away. Now, everybody knows 
not everybody, I guess, but anybody that's ever watched any kind of true crime documentary knows that the first 48 hours are the most crucial, crucial hours of the entire investigation. And the police work, there's no other way to describe it other than shit. It was complete shit in the first 48 hours. The detective that was in charge of this investigation, he literally stood up on a table at a park where everybody was meeting to go find Johnny and said, he's nothing but a damn runaway. Everybody go home. Naturally, everybody got kind of pissed thinking, what the hell, the gosh has wanted our help and we took time out of our day to go and try and look for little Johnny Gosh and he's a runaway so basically almost like a mob was around the Gosh's home and Noreen and John were like what the hell is happening the people showed up and they were like hey you know we're trying to help you why don't you want our help now and the Goshes were like, we still want your help. What the hell's going on? At this point in time, Miss Noreen Gosh, who I admire to the nth degree, this woman is feisty. She ended up basically doing her own police investigation. She went out and started putting up flyers, gathering people to go look for Johnny. Going on radio shows, going on TV, trying to say, hey, Johnny, please come home. Because at this point in time, and to this day, there's no proof that he is dead. Now, the authorities were basically non-existent in this entire investigation. They were not trying their hardest, and it was pretty damn obvious. There was a 23-day search, and it covered a very little, small area around the Gosh's home. And they found nothing. They interviewed a few neighbors, and one neighbor had said that uh, they had witnessed Johnny being shot by something and he fell to the ground and then two men put him into a van, a blue two-tone Ford Fairmount to be exact, and screeched off. And then there was another account of Johnny walking down the street and he was asked by the same van, a two-tone blue Ford Fairmount, and this man had asked for directions. Johnny did not feel comfortable talking to this guy, so he kind of just walked away. But as Johnny walked away, there was a man that kind of came out of nowhere and started following Johnny. As soon as Johnny disappeared around the corner from this neighbor's line of sight from his bedroom window, that's when apparently he got snatched up because the neighbor on the other block happened to be looking out the window at some time in the morning. I don't know why everybody was looking out the window at this fucking point in the morning. This is basically dawn. I can see why that there's not that many witnesses. Another account says that after he went around that corner, there were two men that didn't shoot him. There was no shooting of him and threw him into a van. The same van screeched around the corner and met up with another plain white unmarked van like the total creeper van that everybody knows about and apparently handed Johnny off and then he disappeared never to be seen again and the police really didn't take any of this seriously at all after 23 days they gave up now Noreen this feisty feisty woman that I admire more than anything and John I gotta say John his dad too he sprung into action Papa Bear over here and they started just pounding the pavement trying to find their son I'd do the same thing any of my kids were missing man I'd whoa, I'd be out there like crazy now this part I'm getting from an article online it's actually on the lineup Dot com. It's a very interesting article. It's fairly accurate from what I can see. I haven't seen anything that's not uh, crazy out of the ordinary with it. But this, this is a snippet from the article. The same year that Johnny vanished, Noreen established a foundation in her son's name, which exists to this day. The organization pushed for legislation that called for an immediate police response to reports of missing children, which should be there already the bill became a law in the state in 1984 after receiving support from the likes of john walsh the host of america's most wanted whose own son was kidnapped and murdered in 1981 we'll end up having an episode on him too i guarantee it very interesting story everybody knows who he is but you might not know the background that his son was actually uh, decapitated and I don't even think they found the rest of his body. I'm pretty sure they only found his head. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's what happened. But ever since then, he's been on a crusade. He's just like Noreen here. The disappearance of his son was in 1981, which was 
just a year before this. The Johnny Gosh bill now requires police to investigate missing child cases immediately instead of waiting 72 hours as they had in Johnny's case. I forgot to say that, yeah. They had a uh, rule back then that they had to wait 72 hours before they really investigated anything because of so many kids running away. They didn't want to waste the money on it. And like I said in the very beginning, and like everybody knows, anybody that's a true crime buff, anybody that listens to any kind of true crime podcast, anybody that's watched a true crime documentary, if you've watched ID Discovery, the first 48 hours are the most crucial. You need to really hit the pavement in those first 48 hours. Because statistics say that your chance of finding this person alive just plummets. And like I said in the intro, Johnny's face was the first face to appear on a milk carton in 1984. And just a few years later, the story gets way crazy, way bizarre, way out there. It's, it's nuts, but there's plenty of evidence to back it up. And I'd like to take this one moment to say something about the word conspiracy. It's starting to piss me off that there's people out there that they hear the word conspiracy, they automatically think of a conspiracy theory that's off the wall. For people that hear conspiracy and think it's some crazy nut job that's thinking it up, go look up conspiracy in the dictionary. Go look it up right now. Now, tell me if this sounds familiar. This is the actual Dictionary definition of conspiracy, a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. It's, it has nothing to do with crazy out there theories. There's a horrible stigma attached to the word conspiracy. I'm sorry to go off into that direction. I needed to say that before we got into all of this because I am going to use the word conspiracy a lot. And you need to know that conspiracy does not always mean tinfoil hat wearing crazy ass motherfucker. Now that I got that out of my system, you guys just heard me get a little pissed off. I apologize for that, but I've been hearing it all week on podcasts. I've been seeing it on TV and it's really gotten to me that the word conspiracy just has a bad stigma attached to it. It really shouldn't. There are plenty of things out there that are conspiracies that can be proven to be true. And conspiracy, the word, for some reason, automatically means that there's no proof that it's true. I'll, I'll get off my tangent now. So this is where the story gets actually pretty crazy. It's gonna get really bizarre, really weird, really disgusting. It may change your view on our government and the people that run it. In 1989, a man named Paul Bonacci came forward with shocking assertions. He claimed that he had been abducted by human traffickers as a teenager and was forced to help in the kidnapping of Johnny Gosh. Benaki claimed that the ring trained children to work for the government and participate in sexual acts in order to make the blackmail of politicians possible. This sex ring Benaki claimed was the work of a man named Lawrence E. King, then director of the Franklin Credit Union in Omaha, Nebraska. Now, an interesting thing about the Johnny Gosh kidnapping in Nebraska Apparently, the plates on the van were from Nebraska, the van that supposedly took Johnny Gosh. So that kind of ties it in a little bit here. Obviously, that can be a huge coincidence, but this was a real thing that actually happened. Like I said with conspiracies, this was a conspiracy to hurt children. And this guy, Lawrence King, his nickname was Larry King. So there was a lot of bad stigma attached to that. Everybody thought they were talking about the Larry King on CNN. I feel bad for that guy because I actually kind of like him. Kind of sullied his name with this whole incident that had happened. Benaki claimed he knew Johnny. He identified a birthmark on Johnny's chest and said that Johnny had talked about going to yoga classes with his mother. A fact his family had not shared with the public. Because he was able to provide intimate details on Gosh, both John and Noreen believed 
he was telling the truth. Nevertheless, the FBI did not consider Benaki a credible witness. And the reasoning why they didn't think he was a credible witness was that he suffered from a multiple personality disorder and had a delinquent past. They believed his testimony was a hoax and declined to seek an indictment against King. In 1990, two of the accusers against Franklin were indicted for perjury. So the accusers were indicted for perjury. The victims in this case. This is a whole nother direction that you could basically do a whole episode on this, but I'm going to kind of not do that. <laughs> I don't want this to all be about the, the Franklin Credit Union scandal. Years went by with no new leads. Then in 1997, Noreen claimed that one early morning at 2.30 a.m. she was awakened by a sound of knocking. When she opened the front door, her son Johnny, now 27, was standing there with a man she had never seen before. Noreen claimed that the two entered her apartment and that they spoke for over an hour before departing. Now, it depends on what website you go to. Because the last one I looked at, it was Johnny and a boy came to the door. And they also said that it was for over two hours, over three hours. It was hours and hours that they talked. And he said that he couldn't stay, that he was in danger. He wasn't even supposed to be there. And then he left. Now, these are some quotes from Noreen about this incident. Johnny would look over to the other person for approval to speak, she told the Des Moines Register, which is uh, ironically the newspaper that he was delivering when all this happened. He didn't say where he was living and where he was going. That's a quote from Noreen again. Though Noreen worked with the FBI to create a new sketch of Johnny's current appearance, the case went cold again. She claimed that she did not contact the police when Johnny showed up because he he warned her that doing so would be detrimental to his safety, and I'm assuming hers too. Noreen claims that her son confirmed that he had been the victim of a pedophile organization and had been cast aside when he grew older. However, he still feared for his life and lived under a new identity, deeming it unsafe to return home. John has stated his uncertainty as to whether or not the visit occurred. Now, this is the the father, Big John, had stated that he was really uncertain that it even occurred. The couple has been divorced since 1993. Before Johnny had, supposed Johnny had showed up at her door, she had gone on uh, Sally Jesse Raphael, I do believe was the name of the show. And it was one of them talk shows from the 90s. Everybody knows about them. They were like uh, Ricky Lake and you had Oprah and all those shows just like that. And Sally Jesse Raphael was just like that too. She went on there and basically told Johnny, hey, you know, me and your dad have been divorced for years now. You know, this is where I live. You know, this is where we're at now, you know, you can come and see me. Just just come home. We miss you. And she was completely convinced that he's still alive because they never found a body. Now, almost 10 years later, on September 1st, 2006, Noreen Gosh returned home to find several disturbing photographs at her doorstep. She claimed that one of the photos showed Johnny bound and gagged with a brand mark on his shoulder. Another photo showed three boys bound and gagged. Just two weeks later, the Des Moines Police Department received an anonymous letter which read, Gentlemen, this is what the actual letter read. Gentlemen, someone has played a reprehensible joke on a grieving mother. The photo in question is not one of her son, but one of the three boys in Tampa, Florida, about 1979 to 1980, challenging each other to an escape contest. There was an investigation concerning that picture made by the Hillsborough County, Florida, this is in Florida, Sheriff's Office. No charges were filed, and no wrongdoing was established. The lead detective on the case was named Zelva. This allegation should be easy enough to check out. In fact, a detective in Florida named Nelson Zelva confirmed that he had investigated the photo of the three boys and could not find evidence 
that anything criminal had taken place. Despite this, Noreen maintains that the other photograph is indeed of Johnny, that he was the victim of a child prostitution ring, ran out of Omaha, Nebraska, and that there was a cover-up that stretches from local law enforcement all the way up to the FBI, and in my opinion, farther. A few theories have surfaced over Johnny Gosh's whereabouts. Noreen firmly believes that her son was abducted and forced into a child sex ring, but the investigation has been hampered because there are a lot of big names involved in the scheme. Even authorities haven't dismissed this theory, but Des Moines police have stated that there is no evidence to suggest that Johnny was part of a pedophile ring. Others believe that Jeff Gannon is actually the boy who was kidnapped many years before Gannon's past is unclear and very mysterious. The conservative journalist quickly gained access to the White House press pool despite using a fake name and not having significant credentials. On January 2005, Gannon asked the president a friendly and factually inaccurate question that raised many red flags and had colleagues looking into his background. It was discovered that Gannon's real name was Jeff Gucker. He was once a high-priced homosexual... Oh my god. He was once a high-priced homosexual escort, and his journalist credentials consisted of a training course at the Leadership Broadcast School of Journalism. Oh my god. If this is true, is that that's how easy it is to get into the White House? I don't want a job there. I'm sure they pay good. Pay me some money. Know how to inspect medical parts. Know how to do that. I can inspect stuff that I can inspect anything. Inspect my own wiener all the time. Thoroughly. Same thing with butthole. Told you to talk about that stuff all the time. And another thing I have to say is at least he was a high priced homosexual prostitute. I'm sorry to make light on this. I'm trying to make this as lighthearted as possible. For everybody that knows this podcast, normally we try to take a lighthearted approach to dark subjects. And this is a very dark subject. And I like to soften it a little bit with some jokes here and there and here and there. So, you don't like it, get over it. Many began to think back to the administration of President Bush's father and of the scandal that involved a high-level official giving private late-night tours of the White House to teenage male prostitutes. Some drew a connection between Gannon and Gosh, especially because both share similar markings on their bodies, one way to clear the air would be to get a DNA test done, but Gannon has refused. And I wonder why. Now, Gannon himself isn't really claiming that he is Johnny Gosh. As far as I know, he isn't claiming that. Another thing I'd like to add to is that... Uh, John and Noreen Gosh, Johnny Gosh's parents, had participated in the trial to try and indict Mr. Lawrence E. King in the sexual assault charges. Another thing I'd like to add about Paul Bonanke, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, that's how it reads is Bonanke. Sounds like the donkey, it's Badonkey, Badonkadonk, which I call him Badonkadonk from now on. Call him Badonkadonk. It's probably wildly inappropriate, but I don't give a shit. So, John and Noreen Gosh were actually supporting Mr. Paul Badonkadonk when he was trying to indict Mr. Lawrence E. King for the sick shit that he did. Now, to go a little, a little more in-depth into what the, happened at the Franklin Credit Union, everything like that, he kind of was laundering money through there, uh... Basically, people would pay him, and he would grab kids from orphanages in Nebraska, and he would grab kids from a place called Boys Town, which is kind of like uh, a girl and boys club, if you guys remember what those were, where kids would go and hang out for the day or whatever. But this was more like an orphanage, so these were like homeless kids that lived at Boys Town. There are several, several people that have come out of Boys Town saying that they were sexually abused by higher-ups in the government, including George H.W. Bush. 
And it's really hard to tell if, you know, some of these people are telling the truth. Because, like, with Bononky, Bononkadonk, he had multiple personality disorder. Nothing against people with multiple personality disorder. I understand it's something that some people cannot control. And if you really do have it, yeah, you cannot control it. Not that some people can't. You cannot control it. Sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, I feel for you guys. That's gotta suck. But it kind of takes away the credibility of the witness when that is happening. At the time he made these accusations, he was in jail for molestation of an underage boy. He was 17 when it happened, so technically the underage thing doesn't really matter, but it was more of forced himself on another boy that was much younger than him, which is disgusting for one, the pedophilia part. I ain't got nothing against gay people. I got something against people that take advantage of children. But yeah, the Boys Town thing... There's a lot of people that have come out of there saying that they were sexually abused. That can be a whole episode in its own. That's where Johnny Gosh may have ended up. We really don't know because, like I said, Paul Bonacchi, he is not, you know, the most credible witness. You know, the, the, the whole thing is, is the only thing that makes him not credible is because he has multiple personality disorder. And it's nothing that it's his fault. But people that have that tend to either misremember things. I'm not saying that anything that happened to him isn't true. But if he's gone through that much trauma, maybe he has seen stuff that he didn't really see, you know? And that fact, I feel for him. Any other way, I don't feel for him because he's a fucking pedophile. And I, my opinion on a pedophile is cut all their dicks off. Just line them up, get a chopping block, get a fucking dick guillotine. A, a dick what what would i call that a, a dickotine you get a dickotine and you just put the dick in there and you just chop that bitch off just leave the ball so they have the sexual urge still but they ain't got no dick no more that's what i think that's enough about the boys town and everything like that because i'm gonna get all riled up but there were yeah i gotta calm down a little bit step back got riled up as you can see in the picture that I took before I did this episode, I'm drinking a rock star, so I need to calm it down a little bit. Bring it down. Bring it down now. Now, there were two similar disappearances in the area that could support an active child predator theory. In 1984, Eugene Martin, another young paper boy, vanished on his route in the early morning hours. In 1986, a 13-year-old, Mark Warren Allen disappeared on his way to his friend's house just down the street. Now, with Eugene Martin, it was very similar. Very similar. It was almost the exact same situation. Except for it wasn't a wagon. It was just his the bag of newspapers. And what had happened was that he had picked up his newspapers. He was ready to deliver them. And the same exact thing happened. The Martin household had been called by all the customers saying, hey, where's my newspaper? And the dad went out saying the same thing, the same exact thing that, you know, he must be just running late. I'm going to go help him out. You know, I'm going to go help him out, make sure he gets this done and everything like that. And then he found his bag down the street. The exact, almost the exact same thing, except for it wasn't a wagon. It was a bag. And that happened on August 12th, 1984. And Eugene Martin was 13 years old. He's in Des Moines, Iowa, delivering the same type of newspaper, same exact newspaper. It's, it's eerily, eerily the same thing. Now, this more supports the theory that it was some random nut job that's kidnapping kids. Because if it was... More of the sex trafficking, which I, I'll tell you at the end, because I'm kind of leaning both ways as I'm going through this. But it kind of supports the just the one guy running around kidnapping kids because he's specifically finding boys by themselves. And you could assume he's killing them after he's doing whatever the fuck that sick fuck is doing with them. I'm sorry for all the swearing, but this episode, you know, has got me a little fired up because of fucking sick bitches. B-I-T-C-H. Bitch. Bitches. 
the only real for sure thing about Johnny Gosh in the end is that he is still missing. And in all likelihood is probably dead. Not to be, you know, obscene about it or anything, but he is most likely dead. That's the part that kind of supports the sex trafficking thing because a body wasn't found. But that doesn't really matter. Here's an example from my home state. And I remember hearing about all of this because this happened in 1989. He was missing up until, I do believe, 2016 is when they actually found his uh, remains. And his name was Jacob Wetterling. For those that live in Minnesota, you absolutely know that name. That is the kid that went missing randomly in Minnesota while riding his bike with his friend. And his bike, there's that famous picture of his bike in a field. And this is kind of how the story went down. I'm not going to get deep into this one. But Jacob Wetterling, age 11, was riding his bike with his brother and a friend when a masked man approached the boys asking for their ages. The man told Trevor Wetterling, his brother, Jacob's brother, 10 years old at the time, and his friend, Aaron Larson, 11 years old, to run away and not to look back. The case had been cold for many years. Many years. From 1989, almost 30 years. There was hopes that he was maybe still alive because there was one guy that was up in, I do believe, St. Cloud area, somewhere around there, that uh, his co-worker had actually said, hey, that's that, it's, that's Jacob Wetterling. Look at him. Look at him. Holy crap, it's Jacob Wetterling. And they thought maybe he was brainwashed and shit like that. But it turned out it wasn't him because he, he had no relation to the Wetterling family. And uh, Patty Wetterling actually became a uh, congresswoman. She's uh, another big advocate for missing and exploited children. The Minneapolis Star Tribune reports that the original suspect in the case, Daniel James Heinrich, age 53, sick fuck, who was arrested last October, which was, this was in uh, this was September 4th, 2016. Oh my God, that is so, September 5th is when, wow, okay, that's a big coincidence. September 5th is when Johnny Gosh got taken. So this came out a day before the anniversary. The Minneapolis Star Tribune reports that an original suspect in the case, Daniel James Heinrich, age 53, who was arrested last October on child pornography related charges and has been in federal custody ever since and agreed to provide information on the location of the remains. Our hearts are broken, Jacob's mother, Patty, told the Star Tribune. We have no words. She had not given up hope on finding him. The significant development in the Minnesota case is a grim reminder of two Iowa boys who went missing in the 1980s as well, both of whom were paper boys. Johnny Gosh, 12 years old, went missing 34 years ago as he was delivering newspapers in his neighborhood. With the news today that possibly Jacob Wetterling's remains were found after many years of waiting by his family, sadly, this would be... Some resolution for his family, Johnny's mother, Doreen, told KCCI. My thoughts and prayers are with them as they wait for the test results. Noreen Gosh still deals with the pain by taking action to keep the case alive. Although she believes her son was a victim of human trafficking and sold to a pedophile, Eugene, 13, Disappeared on August 12th, 1984, while delivering newspapers in Des Moines, Iowa. Older cold cases, authorities said, are reviewed on a yearly basis, and the department has a select group of officers who specifically look at old cases. I'm really doubting that they put their whole heart and soul into it. I'm not saying that cops are lazy or anything like that. Uh, I do have a cousin that's a cop, and I'm actually pretty proud of that. Family man. Really good guy. There's plenty of good cops out there. I know this for a fact. But something in me tells me that they're not boots on the ground anymore, which I can't really blame them because... The kid's been missing for so long, but it was the authorities' fault that nothing has been resolved yet. That's why there's so many speculations out there. 
So many speculations. Now, here are some of the similarities between Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin. Number one, they were about a year apart in age at the time of their disappearances. Number two, they were both paper boys for the Des Moines Register, which is really weird. I'm not laughing, just saying that that's really weird. Number three, they vanished on an early Sunday morning. Number four, they went missing around the same time of year, August slash September. In fact, Jean vanished only three weeks shy of the two-year anniversary of Johnny's disappearance. Number five, the abductions took place roughly eight miles apart, which is relatively close. Number six, they occurred in quiet, suburban, low-crime neighborhoods. Number seven, Johnny's wagon and Jean's bag, both filled with undelivered papers, were found abandoned on the street corners. Number eight, there were no signs of a struggle at either scene. Number nine, their disappearance went unnoticed until around 7 a.m. when customers began calling to ask where the newspapers were. Number 10, there is nothing to indicate that either boy ran away from home. Gene was going to turn 14 in less than a week and had plans to pick out a new bicycle with his dad. Johnny was described as a happy, responsible, well-adjusted boy who took his newspaper route very seriously. It was very unusual for a runaway, especially one that young, to run away and successfully stay hidden for such a long period of time. There have been no verified signs of life since the day they vanished. No activity on their social security numbers. No indication that they ever tried to get a job or buy a car. Nothing. Neither boy has ever been found. Makes you really think what the real scenario is here. You know, I can't blame Miss Noreen Gosh for thinking the things that she's thinking. I can't blame her. I commend her for her efforts. This woman is tenacious. Same thing with Patty Wetterling. Same thing with John Sr. Not to throw him aside, because I've noticed in most of these articles, they don't mention him a lot. But from what I've heard in some articles, little snippets... The guy worked just as hard as Noreen to try and find Johnny. And as a dad myself, I know the feeling. I don't know the feeling of losing my child, but I know the fear of losing my child. So that was kind of a, uh, you know, I could go on for hours with this. In all honesty, this could be a nine hour episode. I could sit here and talk forever, Ma Bacchus. But I'm not going to. I've given a lot of evidence already given a lot of stories, read a lot of different articles, and I'm proud to say none of it came from Wikipedia. Now, I encourage you guys to do what you can to find these missing children that you see up at Walmart, anywhere. You see something weird, call the police. Worst thing that can happen is they show up and it's, it's nothing. If you don't call and it ends up being something, you know, that's... It's, you end up with kids like this. You know, there was witnesses of, apparently witnesses of him getting drug into a car, Johnny Gosh, getting drug into a car after he's shot by something. And no one said shit. The Goshes are the ones that contacted the police after finding the wagon and the dog. There's no chance that this kid was a runaway at all. I'm going to give my opinion right now. I'm going to give it. So this one was a little bit more difficult than most of the ones that I've gone through. Most of the episodes that I've gone through. Because most of the time in my brain, it's pretty cut and dry. You know, I've got kind of that logical brain where, you know, certain things are only possible, blah, da, 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 da. I had a difficult time trying to pick a side here, but Conspiracy Asylum, we like to pick a theory. You don't have to stick with it. I have the right to change my mind at any point in time. I have the right to be wrong. So if there's anything that I missed... If there's anything you'd like to add to this, go ahead and hit us up, theconspiracyasylum at gmail.com. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We are on the fucking Pine Trist. We're on Facebook. We're on Pinterest. We're on all of them. We're on everywhere. Just check us out. And go to our website, conspiracyasylum.simdif.com.
hit us up with any other kind of theories that you have. But my opinion, I'm going to stand by this. Not a whole lot of evidence for it, but I think it's too big of a coincidence. And there's a lot of similarities between these two paper boys being taken around the same time. I won't say around the same time, within the same decade. And in, a, in almost the same kind of way as Jacob Wetterling. And the fact that James Heinrich, when he was arrested, had just an album full of child pornography. People that abduct kids, this is what they're gonna do. Because they're sick fucks. And like I said, they need a dickotine. Fucking dickotine. Chop off they dicks. Leave the balls so they still got the sexual urge. Chop off they dicks. And they can't do shit to nobody. That's what I think. That's my opinion on pedophiles, at least. Now, my opinion is that James Heinrich went down to Iowa because it's not that far. Des Moines only a couple hours away, especially from where I'm at. I'm in Hastings. I could probably get to the Iowa border in probably an hour and a half. So maybe two hours, especially without fucking cold. It's negative 45 right now. Negative 45 wind chill. The normal temperature is negative 22. Sick of this shit. <laughs> I do believe that James Heinrich is the perpetrator of Johnny Gosh's disappearance and Eugene Martin's disappearance. Now, Mr. Piece of Shit Heinrich, fucking butthole Heinrich, is currently serving a 20-year sentence for his atrocities in a Massachusetts federal prison. This piece of shit Heinrich fucking asshole piece of fucking butthole Heinrich here. He described how he had killed Jacob Wetterling. Now, this is just a theory of mine. There really isn't a whole lot of evidence to support it, but a person like this doesn't just kill once. Now, it could be Danny Heinrich. What I'm saying is that it was, I don't think he got sold into uh, sex slavery. I do not believe that. For the main fact that I don't believe that is that two paper boys had been taken around the same time. And that means that there's someone out there looking for a certain type of person. Now, a pedophile ring, which they do exist. I'm not arguing with that. A pedophile ring, though, there's rich people that they basically order children. They say, hey, I want a kid that's this height, this weight, looks like this, blonde hair, blue eyed, whatever. And that's not what happened here. These are two different kids that look completely different. And Heinrich said that he didn't touch a child past 1989, which I don't believe that shit for a minute. But this all happened before 1989, and he had the means necessary to do this. So I'm going to put the Conspiracy Asylum stamp of approval. Johnny Gosh was kidnapped and murdered by Daniel James Butthole Heinrich, and he needs the dickotine. That's what I would have sent him to do. Dick a teen and life in prison. Because a guy like that, that does things like that, is going to get turned the fuck out in prison. You can see him with his fucking shirt tucked into the top, you know, with the, you know, you take the bottom of your shirt and tuck it into the top, and he's got his pants sagging, so he's ready for butt sex. Nothing against gay people, once again. But he's probably getting raped right now, which is fine with me. Give him the dick a teen, let him get raped. And also, my opinion. On Lawrence E. King. He's a pervert. He's a piece of shit. He get, he needs a dickotine too. Give him the conspiracy asylum. Motherfucker did get dickotine. Motherfucker dickotine. Just chop his fucking balls off. Send him to fucking prison. Let him get butthole raped. All day. What he did to all them little boys. <laughs> He's a piece of shit. So that's my opinion on him too. And the whole Franklin credit union shit. And if the higher ups were like that too, they deserve a dickotine. Just line up, just fucking start chopping. Dickotine, 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 dickotine. Like I said, that was in my opinion. And I'm sticking to it. If you've got a different opinion, you'd like to give me some more evidence, anything like that, even if you don't have a whole lot of evidence to support it. It's just a theory. Hit us up. The conspiracy asylum at gmail.com. And I almost forgot we should have done this at the beginning of the episode. But the trivia question from the last solo episode, which is what I'm going to start calling these. The trivia question for the last solo episode, the Chris Benoit episode, which has gotten 
very popular. The last I looked, there was 125 hits on it, and it's only been up for like two days. So thank you very much to every single listener out there. But the trivia question was, what is the name of the podcast? Our cat. The one that is almost featured in every single episode because he inserts himself into everything. He hasn't come around me right now because he's probably sleeping because he's lazy as hell. But I love him. I love the little guy. Big guy. He's actually a very big cat. What is the name of the podcat? The podcat's name is Eli. And we love him very much. He is the podcat. And the trivia question for this bonus episode, which will be answered on the next bonus episode, is what was... Chris Benoit's son's name. Not the full, you don't even know, need to know the full name. What was Chris Benoit's son's name? Just first and last. And the last should be easy. So you just need to know the first, basically. Go ahead, hit us up. TheConspiracyAsylum at gmail.com Remember to put the THE in front of it. Conspiracy Asylum. The conspiracy asylum at gmail.com. Everything else is conspiracy asylum. We got the twatter. We got the fast book. We got the fucking pine tryst. I'm going to start making chocolate buttholes on Etsy. And remember Patreon. Give me a dollar. Hit me up. Give me a dollar. We have zero patrons so far. But if you can find it in your heart to give us a dollar, that'd be great. We don't really make any money off of this. Any kind of money that we'd make off of Patreon would end up going right back into the podcast, just making it better and better, which I've already invested a bunch of money into it because it's my hobby. And I don't care if I spend money on it. Because you spend money on hobbies. And I'd like to give a special shout out to an Angie Smith who hit us up on Instagram. And she hit me up with a uh, paranormal story that happened to her. And a reminder to all of you that I'm trying to collect paranormal stories, uh, alien encounters from our listeners. Stuff that happened to you guys. If you're willing to share it with us, we can do it anonymously. We don't need to say your name over the air. It's fine. But if you don't want to, that's cool too. I'm just looking to compile some stories together and do a whole listener episode for the co-conspirators. So remember to hit us up, send it all to theconspiracyasylum at gmail.com or you can send it to any other direct message. If you don't want it out in the public, out in the open, direct message us, please. Remember, hit us up, theconspiracyasylum at gmail.com. Got anything to add? Do it. Hit me up. Your padded cell is now open. You may leave. Thank you, co-conspirators. Bye.